If you've ever explored in and around Buffalo, one building stands out among the rest. With its iconic towers, massive stonework, and sprawling landscape, the Richardson Olmsted campus is a breathtaking example of American architecture. When I was first driving up, you just are inspired and awed by this building and really kind of taken aback by how majestic it is and what a significant piece of architecture it is. This building is a National Historic Landmark, and it's because of three men, Frederick Law Olmsted, Henry Hobson Richardson, and Dr. Thomas Story Kirkbride. Kirkbride designed an idea for how mentally ill people should be taken care of. Within its walls is an equally important piece of history. It served as the Buffalo State Asylum for the Insane with a revolutionary model for the treatment of people with mental illness. But as that era of treatment came to an end, the hospital closed, and its future was uncertain. No one had the money to do anything, so this building really was sitting, and no one had any idea what to do with it. For decades and decades and decades, this complex had a negative impact on the community around it. My first memory of being here is building surrounded by a chain link fence and everything about it said, you're not supposed to be here. It was a big, scary, empty, falling apart set of buildings. We wanted to reverse that, not just for the building itself, but for the people who live around it. It took decades to build. It endured decades of neglect. But in the hands of a community dedicated to preserving it, the Richardson Olmsted campus is being reimagined. Reimagining a Buffalo landmark has been funded by the Peter C. Cornell Trust, by the Zemsky family, and by the members of WNED WBFO. Thank you. Western New York has buildings designed by Louis Sullivan, Frank Lloyd Wright, and H. H. Richardson, but some call the Trinity of American Architects. The people here are also proud of another architectural legacy. Their own preservation of these structures in such a way that they hold a purpose for future generations. They're more than just symbols. I think it's part of our nature as a society. It gives us kind of a guide or a, like a library of where we've come from and what our culture is built on and why that culture is important to us. Many American cities saw rapid growth in the mid-1800s. Old buildings were demolished for new ones, each one more impressive than the last. As a key hub for transporting goods, Buffalo was no exception. But after its peak in the 1950s, it was hit hard by economic decline. We have had a lot of buildings that have been preserved just because there hasn't necessarily been a new economic purpose to put that site or that building to. A lot of it didn't get torn down like it did in a lot of places. So now people come and visit and they say, oh, wow, what great bones you have in the city of Buffalo, you know, and look at the fabric of the city. It's true. It's true, we didn't get rid of most of it. We've seen some of our most iconic buildings saved as a result. Like Louis Sullivan's skyscraper, the Guarantee Building, and Frank Lloyd Wright's opus, the Darwin Martin House Complex. Towering over them all, is the massive historic preservation of the Richardson Olmsted campus. Its story as the Buffalo State Asylum for the Insane takes us back to the 1860s, at a key period in Buffalo's history. By the Civil War, Buffalo had only been incorporated as a city for about 30 years, but relentless growth in business and an influx of population was causing it to burst at the seams. With that in mind, they invite Frederick Law Olmsted, who is now known as the father of landscape architecture, to come to Buffalo and create what we would now call a city plan. While Olmsted and his partner, Calvert Vaux, were designing its landscape plan, Buffalo was in a bidding war with the cities of Lockport and Batavia to build a state asylum for the insane in western New York. 
Buffalo does win by offering a supply of perpetual free water to the hospital. The hospital would never have to pay for water, never have to worry about it. The city would provide it for free. And they did for about 100 years. Buffalo allotted 200 acres adjacent to Delaware Park. Olmsted and Vox designed the grounds, while Henry Hobson Richardson, a young and relatively unknown architect, was chosen to design the buildings. This was H.H. H. Richardson's largest commission of his entire career. It was the first place where he really perfected his personal style of architecture, which came to be called Richardsonian Romanesque. The most obvious thing about Romanesque architecture is it's made of stone, massive stone, and not highly finished stone, rough stone. It's treated in a very rough way, the way a medieval mason might have done. It became his signature style, but it also influenced the course of American architecture in the 1880s and 90s, when many other architects imitated what he had invented here at the State Hospital. This campus is just enormous. The campus is large. It's 42 acres, 13 buildings, 500,000 square feet of building space. It takes a mile to get around the entire campus. And this stonework is just so impressive. This is massive. This is Medina sandstone. It was uh, mined in the Medina, New York area, brought here on the Erie Canal, and chipped and fitted in place to create these massive walls. And this stone is the reason why these buildings have stood the test of time. Richardson's design of the structures was revolutionary for the time, but the vision for the function of the buildings came from an equally revolutionary physician in Philadelphia. Dr. Thomas Story Kirkbride was one of the first American physicians to come along and say that we could be doing better for people with mental illness. Prior to his arrival on the scene, literally what was recommended was to lock your loved ones with any kind of mental illness in a specially built shed in your backyard. That was what was recommended. We talk a lot about the stigma of mental illness, and we talk about how to eliminate that. With the advent of state institutional care, we moved from a, a system of restraint to a medical model of treatment and a moral model of treatment. So this was a revolutionary idea about the treatment of people with mental disabilities. They said, no, this is like a disease, and people can be treated, and they should be treated kindly and respectfully, and that they can get better. Kirkbride believed that your physical environment could affect your mental health. So his hospitals were built along a very specific plan. It begins with a center administration building, followed by hospital wards, which spread from it like a flock of geese in flight. It prescribed fresh air, sunshine, lots of light and airy spaces, and exercise as a way to cure whatever was ailing you. Olmsted and Vox reoriented the buildings to maximize sunlight through the windows and designed the landscape, including a working farm to be used as part of the therapy. Olmsted's contribution to this kind of an idea was that nature heals and the people are outside, that they will indeed get better. The interior of the Kirkbride plan was predicated on these long day rooms. Patient rooms were tiny. They were only 9 feet by 11 feet, and that was on purpose. It was really to encourage patients to spend just their sleep time in there and then spend all their daytime in the day room. Occupational therapy and craft work was very popular as forms of treatment and a way to keep busy if you were a patient. Basket weaving was very popular, painting, putting on plays. The fact that that level of treatment, revolutionary treatment, was being conducted at the Buffalo State Hospital is really something, I think, for Western New Yorkers to be proud of. The first patients were admitted in 1880 as soon as the main structures were completed. And as construction continued, patients filled up each new building. From 1900 to 1945, the hospital saw a constant increase in the number of patients who needed care. Additional buildings and cottage-style structures were added throughout the grounds to accommodate new treatments, patients, and staff who lived on campus. According to the Kirkbride plan, this was designed as an acute care facility. No one was supposed to stay here longer than one year. 
People are spending their whole lives in this building. And once that starts to happen, overcrowding almost immediately becomes an issue. This hospital was built to house 660 patients. By the 1950s, which was the height of the use of the hospital, 3,600 patients were living here. By the 1960s, advancements in the treatment of mental illness and in medication were removing the need for asylums. Many people could get better at home. As a result, the population of the hospital began to decline. With the whole movement toward normalization, taking people out of institutions, it became clear that this hospital was not going to be continuing to function the way it was. The massive complex had outlived its usefulness. In 1963, a new modern hospital was built on the grounds to better accommodate the remaining patients who needed a higher level of care. So the last patient moved out of this building in 1974. From that point until 2006, when the Richardson Center Corporation takes over, it is largely abandoned by the state. The vacancy of the Richardson Olmsted campus, plus the untimely decline of the city, left few resources for any care and upkeep, and no real vision for the future. You can see some neglect from the outside, but coming inside, it brings it into stark focus. Once you come inside, you see what decades of neglect can do to buildings like this. So what a building looks like when you abandon it for 40 years in Buffalo is that you have the hot humidity of Buffalo summers and the freezing cold of Buffalo winters. So a lot of expanding and contracting of water pipes. You have a lot of blizzardy days, which means the roof is being torn off by weather and there are holes. You have the plaster work crumbling and falling off of the very frame of the building. There have always been lots of ideas about what to do here. Sure, but until you have resources, I mean, they're just ideas and dreams, exactly. right? Exactly. Precisely. Yeah. yeah. Over the years, a number of proposals were considered. Should part of the campus become a school? Or maybe it should become additional housing and educational space for Buffalo State College? Or perhaps additional art gallery space? Preservationists always saw the potential. We have a very active civic community, and I think our historic preservation people have been on the ball for really quite a while, and I think have saved a lot of things. In 1973, the building was placed on the National Register of Historic Places. They did that because they wanted to hold the importance of this building, because they knew that in 1974, they were moving all the patients out. So it's like, what kinds of gestures can you do that say that this is an important place, that this is a culturally important place? And in 1986, it received the highest distinction as a National Historic Landmark. The National Historic Landmark gives it some protection. It says this is a very special place to all of us, but it does not give protection from demolition. It really still requires a committed group of people to to see it through. Despite the title of National Historic Landmark, the buildings continued to deteriorate. And its future was further threatened in 2000 when New York State placed the campus on a list of surplus properties to be sold. Sam Hoyt, when he was in the assembly, was able to take this property off of the for sale list. And that was one of the key efforts that led to saving it. Also, at this time, the Preservation Coalition started a lawsuit against the state. It's kind of this idea that the government sometimes thinks that buildings belong to them, but what this argument is saying is that, no, no, you hold this in trust for the public, and you are not taking care of this building. So their protests led to the courtroom where the state Supreme Court, using a little-used public buildings law, um, said to New York State, you got to do something about this building. You got to stabilize it. You got to seal it up. It's it's rapidly deteriorating. It's your responsibility. And preservationists saw down the road that this could be the kind of thing that would help with Buffalo's rebirth. So did the publisher of the Buffalo News. Stanford Lipsy had been an enormous advocate for architectural preservation throughout the city. This would be his next big project. He knew it would take a substantial financial commitment on behalf of the state. There were so many community members who said, 
that's never gonna happen. And by golly, Stan showed him up as he always did. Stan could be very persuasive, really pragmatic in his approach, just following the same lead until he got what he wanted or desired. And so um, I, think he, I think he worked the governor pretty hard. In 2003, Governor Pataki earmarked the money, $100 million to rehabilitate the buildings and grounds. But that full amount didn't survive the political process. A portion of it was reassigned to other projects. In the end, a little over $76 million remained. That was enough to begin the effort. $76.5 million opened the door for all kinds of possibilities with this complex. And two years after that, there was the establishment of a board that was led by Stanford Lipsy, the publisher again of the Buffalo News, that oversaw what was to happen here. Too many organizations think too small. So they get a local board together. They may not even be careful about who they put on their local board. But if I wanted this to be a national treasure, I had to have prestigious people. And so that's what I did. I went out and got people from a number of different disciplines and it made all the difference in the world. He really wanted it to be a board of doers. So it was a very, very active working board and it remains that way to this day. They received the financial commitment from the state in 2006. Active construction, years later. What were they doing all that time? As it turns out, quite a lot. This place needed to be studied. So they did a historic structures report, a cultural landscape report, an environmental impact study. They even brought in the Urban Land Institute. And they needed to stop deterioration, and fast. The first $10 million went towards stabilizing the buildings. We didn't know what we were gonna do with the buildings. We didn't know where it was gonna start. We had no master plan. But we knew that as stewards of the complex, and we really take that role seriously, that the first thing we needed to do was make sure that, you know, it, it didn't get any worse. My first memory of being here is building surrounded by a chain link fence. And everything about it said, you're not supposed to be here. We knew that for decades and decades and decades, this complex had a negative impact on the community around it. It was a big, scary, empty, falling apart set of buildings. And we wanted to reverse that, not just for the building itself, but for the people who live around it. Buffalo's had a lot of divisive development efforts when it comes to historic buildings, where the public doesn't always feel like it's being heard. Uh, we are so pleased to welcome you all tonight to our 10th public meeting. So I think mindful of that, the Richardson Olmsted board set out to make sure that it really involved the public. There's a place there to ask questions. We all thought it was better at each stage to bring it to the public and say, this is where we are now, and this is what we'll do next. And do you have any ideas or input for us moving forward? You're helping forge a relationship between the people in your community and this project that's going to be happening. And the better that those things are, the better the people take care of their places which is what we want. All these studies and assessments and public meetings brought the board a clear vision for the future of the campus. They decided to focus on three things in the first phase of rehabilitation. Number one, revitalize the South Lawn. Number two, create an architecture center. And number three, transform the iconic Towers building and its first two wings into a hotel and conference center. The idea of a privately run hotel and conference center fit well with the master plan and the public because it would enhance tourism to the region. It was named Hotel Henry, a nod to Henry Hobson Richardson himself. One of the most historic features is the 210 foot long corridors. Usually people think of historic features as like a fancy piece of plaster or a beautiful fireplace, but in this case, it's the volume of that space and the importance of the use of it. This hallway is so impressive. I mean, the length, the width, the width. It's width. massive. It's almost palatial. Sure. 
And what are we uh, entering here? Now we're in the connector. Every set of buildings had connectors that would allow traffic to move back and forth between the buildings. Lots of original features. For example, this Minton tile, it's part of the original decoration scheme, and it stood the test of time. It's still here from the 1880s. So what other original features? You seem to have kept a lot of them. Here's something especially interesting. When we took out a non-original wall, we revealed the stencil that was part of an original decoration scheme. The stencil would have gone along the length of the corridor here and much higher. And instead of covering it over, it would decided to frame it like historic art and preserve it for people to see. That's just fantastic. Yeah. Some of the funding of the rehabilitation was through preservation tax credits. That means there are things you can change architecturally, but many things you cannot. Any projects here take vision. You need to ensure that you're adhering to state historic preservation guidelines, and those are rigorous. National Park Service guidelines, even more rigorous. It's certainly a challenge uh, for any developer, or even an end user, because the building really can't be adjusted or modified very much. We picked the firm Deborah Burke Partners. They're a national firm that worked on hotels and adaptive reuse, along with Flynn Battaglia Architects, a very skilled local firm. Almost every one of the local national historic landmarks Flynn Battaglia has had their hand in. The biggest challenge of a building like this is that it's an adaptive reuse. It's wonderful when you get an opportunity to adaptively use one of those buildings and give something to the whole community. It took some creative thinking to reimagine the original 9 by 11 foot patient rooms as modern hotel rooms. We carefully placed some bump outs into the hall. When you look down the hall, it almost looks like there's um, like armoires or like some piece of furniture that looks like maybe it could have been there originally. Like it doesn't really call your attention and it definitely doesn't change the view shed at all, but it does give a little bit of room for the plumbing, for the bathrooms and everything like that. Another challenge was the hospital's rear entrance. It looked very different before the rehabilitation. And as the new entry for the hotel, the public had a lot to say about what should go in its place. I don't think we need a 21st century uh, addition. I didn't like that. It looked like bars to me. It didn't look welcoming. It really detracts to me from the aesthetics. So that was really great feedback. We were able to put some more money into the design and have less of the bars and the vertical and make it meet the needs and desires for this new grand entry. And we're really proud of how it turned out. I feel most proud that the public process was genuine and real, and it wasn't protocol just to meet certain standards. And there were a number of things that were altered or refined over the years because of the input that was received. In 2013, the first of the main goals was achieved, revitalizing Olmsted's beautiful South Lawn and opening it to the public. And once the hotel was completed, they partnered with the Buffalo Philharmonic Orchestra to host a much more ambitious event to honor the history of the site. We thought it would be a pretty great idea to have an event where the building was highlighted and the grounds were highlighted. The evening featured not only the orchestra and a grand light show, but educated everyone on the history behind the building, which many were learning for the first time. We loved the idea that it told a story about mental health and, and about the evolution of this building. We thought maybe, maybe 5,000 people would come, but that night, 15,000 people came. Every single spot was taken. It was, it was really magical. We are very, very fortunate at this point in time that preservation has become such an important factor. The community has really rallied around preserving these unique assets. 
that's a huge step in the right direction. The challenge now is moving from public money to private money to pay for further development across the rest of the campus. We've rehabbed a third of the campus so far. People think of the Richardson Towers and they think the whole entire building is that tower's building, where really that's the tip of the iceberg. We have other buildings besides that. There's lots of really interesting ideas. I think the big difference is now we don't have $100 million in state money to spend. This building isn't for everyone. This is not a cookie cutter, ground up development. It's very, very expensive to renovate historic buildings. It's a delicate balance of who brings the dollars to the table and what we're able to do, but we're always gonna be true to the mission of this project. For years, the community had no access to the campus. The projects in the first phase of the master plan all focused on changing that, including an architecture center that welcomes the public and tells two stories. One is the history of the building. The other highlights architectural gems found throughout the city. I would say more than anything else, the architecture center was driven by Stan Lipsy. He wanted a place where people could learn about what architecture and landscape architecture there is here in Buffalo. Going all the way back to our heyday, you can really see a story evolve as you explore the city through the decades. And what's so exciting about bringing the Lipsy experience to the community is that it's not really about us, it's really about promoting and being a cheerleader for the architecture of Buffalo and the Western New York region. If I go back to the beginning of what this project was, it was Frederick Law Olmsted and Henry Hobson Richardson and Thomas Kirkbride, all innovators in their own fields who came together to design something for people with mental illness that would give them a, a sense of community, a purpose. It was a place that treated people with dignity and respect and tried to give them the supports that they needed to be healthy and successful. This is a site about people. Um, so sometimes it's easy for us to just think about it as Richardson Building and Olmsted Grounds, but it's really about the people who had mental health care here, the people who saved it over time, the people who helped to rehabilitate it. I really think it's about all of us, and it really says something about Buffalo and about who we are. Reimagining a Buffalo landmark has been funded by the Peter C. Cornell Trust, by the Zemsky family, and by the members of WNED WBFO. Thank you 